Okay. Oh yes, I was making coffee. That's right. There we go. Can't lecture without coffee. Hmm. Much better. Okay. Um, I'll get moving here in a minute. I'd like to wait a little bit for people to stream in. If you've got any kind of questions or anything, feel free to hit me in chat or at this point, just speak up and I'll answer anything you got. Um, otherwise, I'll get moving in you know, a minute or so. In case folks are wondering with the peer reviews, the peer reviews will go out. Uh, I think they're automatically set to go out, um, possibly even like right now or something like that. They'll go out and then they're due the same time as the next homework is due. So it's kind of a, a cycle where both the previous week's peer review and the current week's homework are both due the same time Tuesday night. So just kind of keep cycling like that till we get to the end. And there'll be no homework or peer review in finals week because I don't want to add on to any possible load you've got on other stuff. Okay, <clears throat> I will go ahead and I will get moving. Um, so today's unit um, is on ggplot. So rather than going into kind of nuts and bolts our programming stuff, I like to start with fun things like visualization and real data manipulation, which is next week. We'll get into nuts and bolts more as the term goes on, but today we're going to go straight to making pretty pictures because it's relatively easy to do um, and it's something you probably want to do and it showcases some of the abilities of R quickly, like right off the bat to uh, sort of sell you on it again, kind of like with our markdown. Okay. So before I do that, I'm going to talk about a few useful things to lead us up to there. Some stuff you probably have had some questions about from last week, including some I fielded in lab and some other places. Um, I'm just going to answer some sort of quick questions, and then we'll talk a little about subsetting data, and then we'll get into actual plotting with ggplot. <clears throat> okay. So first thing I want to talk about you might have noticed in some of the code chunks I have in here, or if you've seen any other R code other people have written, that sometimes there is code that looks like this. There'll be something like here, I've just created an object called new.object. I've assigned a vector of the numbers one through 10 to it, but then there's a pound sign and some random text over here, <clears throat> okay? So the pound sign or hashtags for the kids in the room, is a commenting symbol in R. Anything you write on the line after the pound sign is not treated as code by R. It's entirely ignored by it. So this is a way that you can write documentation to yourself in your code, in your scripts, in your chunks, um, just to let you know what you're doing. I highly recommend annotating your code a lot, especially when you're early on in your R career so that you know what you're doing when you return to something. So I always say in this class that the greatest, my greatest enemy is past Chuck. So past Chuck sometimes has a tendency to not comment his code and annotate it because it is obvious what he was doing in some block of code. Well, if you return to a project a year later, you will find the things that were obvious to past you a year ago are not obvious to present you and you will be very upset about it. <clears throat> I recommend commenting a lot, explain what you're doing. 
in a professional software development environment, there is a lot of documentation and commenting on things. In fact, there's generally a lot more comment than actual code in like a professional environment. <clears throat> I don't necessarily think you should go that far. And often the type of code you're going to learn in this class is fairly self-documenting, but still it's a good idea. If you ever write anything that you're like, oh, this is kind of clever. It being clever is a hint, maybe you should write a little sentence about what that's doing because later you might be like, this works and I have no idea why, or this doesn't work and I have no idea why, and I thought it worked a year ago. Comment your stuff, the pound sign is how you do that. Okay. Um, if you're in markdown documents, comments are just for inside of chunks because you can just write normal text outside of a chunk. In an R script, anything that doesn't have a pound sign before it, for the most part, gets treated as code. Okay, so another thing, you can save and load R objects onto your computer as files so you can open them back up. This is something I do a lot on intermediate things. Like if I run some models that take, you know, five, 10 minutes to run or hours or days to run, I will save the output object so I don't have to rerun it again. This is good too if you're working with an R Markdown document, you don't want it to have to run for 45 minutes every time you knit it. Okay. So you can save an object, an R object on your computer by saying, <clears throat> save the name of the object you'd like to save and then file equals a file name or path. So here I've just said, I wanna save this as new.object.rdata and it's gonna save this file as this. You can open up these saved things using the load function. I could say load new.object.rdata and it will load up this thing and you would see new.object appear in your global environment and you'd be able to access it and use it, okay? So an obvious question to this is where exactly are these files being saved to and loaded from? Okay, so if you save something, it's got to go somewhere on your computer. R has places it likes to put things by default. Okay, so where R is saving files and looking for files is your current working directory. So anytime when you're currently in R, like if you've got R Studio open right now, you can run the command get wd nothing in the parentheses necessary, get WD, and it will show you your current working directory. This is where your R right now is looking to save or load files. When I generated these slides again last night, my working directory for this was on my C drive, my user account here, my folder for this particular class, lectures in week two, because this is the week two lecture. Okay, so this was the working directory that was active when I was running this document. It's the folder that this RMD file was in. Okay, so you can change your working directory. If you want to go and load files or save files to some location other than the one your current working directory is, you can change this. You can say set WD and then give it some path on your computer. <clears throat> Unless you're stalking me and you've changed your username on your computer to be the same as mine, this will not work for you. The thing about paths is these paths are tend to be computer specific, especially if you're using like, you know, your username locations. Okay, so you can change your working directory to somewhere else. Okay, the thing is though, don't set your working directory in our markdown documents. It will generally not really work. What it will do is it will change the working directory for the single chunk you set the working directory in, and then it will revert back in the next chunk. <clears throat> the thing about our markdown documents is they already automatically set whatever folder they're in to be their working directory. So if you want your R Markdown document to be able to access some external files, just put them in that folder or in a subfolder near it, next to it, and it'll be able to access them. This is really nice because it also makes them portable. If you move that document and the files next to it, you can put them anywhere you want, it will work. If I move a project around that uses working directories like this, like to somebody else's computer, well, this user CC land documents doesn't exist on somebody else's computer, so we'd have to manually change it. Manually changing working directories is something that upsets our users like myself, so I highly recommend you don't do it. Use instead pathways with your R Markdown documents or our studio projects, which I'll talk about. Okay, <clears throat> so managing your files and on. 
when you're managing an R project, and when I say R project, I just mean literally anything you're working on in R, usually a project is something like a, a batch of things. I recommend it's best to give each project, like a homework assignment, its own folder. You might consider like an entire article you're working on to be a project, your entire dissertation could be one large project. My dissertation is broken up into a project for each chapter, but the overall thing I can really think of as being one project. Okay, so when managing it, I use a system like this. I take every class or project and give it its own folder on the computer. Each assignment or task has a folder inside of that as well, which is the working directory for that particular item. So a homework one, homework one has a homework one folder, in there is a homework one RMD, and that RMD treats that folder as its working directory. If it needs any files, I stuff them in there too. Okay. So the .rmd and .r files are named clearly and completely. It's unambiguous what everything is. I don't like to have a lot of test.r or file1.r type files because I don't know what they are unless I open them up, name them completely. <clears throat> so for example, it works like this in terms of this document you're looking at right now. This document is in a GitHub folder which stores all of my public GitHub repositories. CSSS 508 is this class. This is a lecture, so it's in the lectures folder. It's a week two lecture, so it's in week two. But then the RMD actually has a full descriptive name, CSSS 508 week two ggplot.rmd, which is unambiguous. If this RMD ended up somewhere outside of this file structure, I would still know exactly what it is. This is just the way I like to do it. It would be perfectly fine to have like lecture.rmd in there, just with the knowledge that every week folder would have a different lecture.rmd. Whatever structure you come up with, it's just nice to be consistent and sort of use that continually so it's easier to find things and deal with your projects. Yeah. So use whatever system you want, just be consistent with it. One thing that's nice about having lots of folders well organized, you don't tend to lose things or overwrite stuff. They're just where you want them to be. And if you're really careful about it, you make it so literally every project you do has the exact same file structure. One way I like to do this is by having functions that actually generate project folders with a constant hierarchy. Um, you always know where everything is across every single one of your projects. You can kind of not have to search anytime you swap projects because the one you were just working on had everything in the same places as the one you just swapped to. And don't have to, but think about it. That little bit of upfront preparation can help you. Yeah. For big projects with many files like this class, I recommend using RStudio's built-in project management system, which is in the top right of the RStudio window. I'll flip over here real quickly and I'll point it out. So in my RStudio window here, if you look in the top right, there's a little thing up here that currently says CSSS 508. This here is the project management section of RStudio. If I click up here, it shows all of the projects I have been working on recently, so I can quickly swap between them. <clears throat> right now I'm teaching this class, so I swapped it over to the CSSS 508 one. <clears throat> if I wanted to go back to working on the chapter of my dissertation I was working on, like 20 minutes ago, I can click this button and it will load up exactly where I am with everything I was working on right here. I don't have it load the files, but I've got all of the code I'm currently working on. So I can tab between different code, pieces of code for my dissertation, whatever. But then if I have to drop everything and teach this class, I click back to my CSSS 508 project and it's exactly where I left everything off. This is nice. The RStudio project management also changes my current working directory appropriately moving around my computer. It kind of takes care of everything. It's a nice way to organize stuff and I recommend using it in general. It's just kind of seamless. It's really nice. Okay. So. I recommend something like that, but you do you, whatever works for you. Okay. Um, for doing things like if you want to make reproducible journal articles, I'm a bit of a fan of uh, Ben Marwick over in Archaeology has created a package called RR Tools for reproducible article sort of distributions. It's sort of an all in one solution for uh, kind of project management for articles. He also has a package Husky Down. Husky Down is a Markdown enabled package for generating dissertations and theses in the University of Washington official LaTeX format, but without you having to do any manual formatting. 
if you just knit an R markdown document using it, it spits it out in thesis and dissertation format official for UW, so you don't have to manually format anything. This is pretty nice if you're going to submit a dissertation or thesis at the University of Washington. Pretty handy. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about file types before we move on to just to make sure you're clear on different file types we're going to use in this class. We're mainly going to work with three types of file. These, ty these types of files are RMD files. RMD files are markdown syntax files. This is where you write code for things that you want to produce a document. If you want to write some R code but have it spit out a memo, an article, a report, or a website, or a presentation, you probably want it to be a .rmd file, a markdown file. They're also .r files. .r are pure syntax files. This is where you would write code to process and analyze data, run your models, generate visualization, but not produce an output document. This is the kind of thing where you'd run a whole bunch of models, do stuff, and you might pull it into an R Markdown document later, the results of it, to display it. But this is just for running things. So most of my data manipulation scripts, like for my dissertation, you know, is broken up into a couple hundred of these .R files that do all the processing for my dissertation. But the actual documents that would produce out to hand somebody a copy of my dissertation would be from RMD files. So the RMD file is for making output. This is for just processing things. So there's also HTML and PDF files. In this class, mostly HTML. These are output documents that get created when you knit that R Markdown document. These are just output. They're static documents. They're for people to look at and see what you've done. Just output. They could also be Word documents, PowerPoints, anything like that. OK. So make sure you understand the difference between these. Um, ask for a clarification or ask questions if you're not clear on the separation between these things. Those aren't dumb questions. I don't expect people to have come in knowing the difference between all of these things. Ask me about it. I'm happy to go into more detail if you're not clear on distinctions between things, where things come from, or when you want to use some particular thing or another. Okay. So that's everything I got on files for today. We'll revisit some of that stuff a while later in the, uh, the class, and I can also help you with it in lecture. But now I want to talk a little bit about data and subsetting before we get into visualization, because you probably don't just want to plot all of the data simultaneously on your plots. Instead, you often want to plot subsets of your data. So you want to know how to do a little bit of subsetting. You saw some in lab, but I resisted showing you uh, the dplyr style ways of doing it you're going to learn in this class because I'm teaching it starting today. OK, so for the rest of the lecture today and for your homework, you're going to be using data from uh, Hans Rosling's Gapminder project. A little excerpt of these data can be accessed through the R package Gapminder, which was put together by Jenny Bryan up at UBC. Um, so if you want to use these data, which you will for your homework, you can do install.packages gapminder, and it will install the gapminder package. You can then load it using library gapminder, and you'll have the data accessible. OK, so if you've done that. Uh, I have a question, Chuck. Yeah. Uh, so when uh, for the last exercise when we were doing this install packages uh, pander, so whenever I was kind of closing down my R Studio and kind of reopening it, it was, and I was running or uh, or knitting the pro, uh, knitting my code, it was again asking that there is error and what was the error? It was saying that your package has not been installed. The pander package is not installed. So is it that? Uh, like we have to install a package every time? No, so there's probably a couple of different things that could be causing that error. Um, so you only need to install the package uh, more or less once per R version. If it gets updated, you can reinstall a package. Um, normally what it is, is you ha don't have a library call loading pander. That might be the thing that's like your first chunk, you'd have to do like library pander to make sure it's loaded. Um, the other thing is you may have actually had an install.packages uh, function call in the document, in which case it will kick an error and will be unable to install it um, because it doesn't like running install.packages in an RMD. If you don't think it's either of those things, send me the RMD or put it in Slack channel and can take a look at it and see what might have been the issue. Okay, thanks. 
Okay. Uh, and also if you run into issues, like it gives you an error or something like that, um, as soon as that happens to you, just shoot it in Slack or something like that. And either Brian or I will, will, when we see it, we'll get to it. Don't hesitate to ask questions. If something puzzles you, even relatively small stuff, feel free to just ask. You're not bothering us by asking something in Slack. So just go ahead, like do that when you're like, whenever you encounter it, we'll shoot back. Um, Brian has a better work-life balance than I do, but I am always on my computer and always have my Slack channel up. So I tend to respond to things like really quickly. Like I see it pop up and I'm just like, oh, okay, and I'll just do it. You know, I'm, I'm probably not doing, probably just like browsing Reddit or something like that. Useless anyway, you're not wasting my time. Okay. Anyway, yeah. So if we check out these Gapminder data, the data frame we're going to work with here for visualization is this data frame Gapminder. If you've done library Gapminder, you will have an object you can access called Gapminder. I can say str for structure to look at the structure of the Gapminder data. The structure of Gapminder is it's a tibble. A tibble is an adorable name for a very specific type of data frame used by the tidyverse. It is a tibble with 1704 rows and six columns. So 1,704 rows, um, if you're used to like working in Excel, sounds like a lot of data. If you're not, it's not very big, but it's big enough you wouldn't display it all at once on your screen. <clears throat> this one has a few different variables in it. It has a variable called country and continent, which are factor variables. These are a type of categorical data. They take a limited number of levels. When it says here country is a factor with 142 levels, it means there's 142 countries in these data. Continent has five levels. There's five continents represented in these data. There's a year column, which is an integer. It takes values like these. Life expectancy is numeric. It's continuous. It takes values like these. Population is an integer, a count of people, values like these. And GDP per capita is a numeric or continuous variable with values like these. Okay. <clears throat> So this is a data set that we'd call a type of panel data or hierarchical data. It is observations of individual years within individual countries within individual continents. It's a multi-level data set. Yeah. So I'm getting error in Gapminder object Gapminder not found even after installing the package. Ah, have you done library Gapminder first? So the, pro the process is always install a package. Once it's installed, you don't need to do it again, but every time you wanna use it in a particular script or a particular time you've opened R, you do have to do library that package. Yeah. If you have done library gapminder and actually run that command and it can't find gapminder, you have a peculiar situation and I'm not sure what that would be. And make sure you have actually run library gapminder. Right. Yeah, you and you've actually so you've actually command enter run this line and then if you immediately run just gapminder on the next line, like so, like if I do library gapminder and do gapminder, it ought to work like that. And it doesn't. But this one runs without an error. Yeah, you could, you could uh, highlight both of them and hit control enter, or you can just, I like to do, I put it here and I hit, hold down control and hit enter and then hit enter again and just keep hitting enter. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's what you got to do. Ah, so here's a good question. How can you see all the countries? If you want to see all the countries, you could say, Okay. That will give you all of them. I did unique Gapminder country, shows you all the unique values. Okay, we'll show you some other ways to do this here, especially next week. Okay. There's a lot of them. Though. Normally, you wouldn't just be displaying. Okay, so we got these Gapminder data. Let's do some stuff with them here in a second. So interesting things here. I've already said there's some categorical data. We're going to spend some time on factors later. There's a pretty good number of observations. It has a nested or hierarchical structure. There's a whole bunch of different years of observations for each country. And then each country is nested in some particular continent. These are what you call panel data. Um, yeah. Okay. 
So we're going to work with this data frame. You're going to work with on your homework too. You'll become real familiar with Gapminder. It's a nice, friendly data set, easy to work with. Um, and we're going to do a lot of plotting of it, things like that. It's easy to work with. We'll get to the hideous data sets later in the term. Okay. So for what we're going to do now, and also for what we're going to do the entire rest of the term, um, we're going to want to have the tidyverse family of packages installed. For the purpose of this particular lecture, we really just want to be able to cut this Gapminder data frame up into subsets, like get just the rows from Afghanistan or only the rows of the data from 1997. We're going to use a package called dplyr to do this. dplyr is part of the tidyverse family of packages, which I use to teach this class. The tidyverse is not the only way to approach R, but it's kind of become one of the dominant ways for people who are especially new to it to learn. It's sort of a nice unified framework for working with stuff. It's not always the fastest, it's not always the most efficient, but it tends to be pretty intuitive. Okay, if you have not already installed the tidyverse, um, go ahead and do install.packages tidyverse and sit back in wonder as it installs an awfully large number of packages into your computer. The tidyverse is indeed a universe of R packages. Um, it's going to install a lot of stuff. Okay, so it's going to install stuff we'll use throughout the term. It's going to install dplyr. It's going to install ggplot. It's also going to install things like stringer that we're going to use in week seven. It's going to install a lot of things we won't use in this class too. Ah, so should we install it in our markdown? No, just install it in the console. So you could go ahead in your console in the bottom of our studio window, just do install.packages tidyverse. Um, if it asks if you want to compile packages, select no, uh, unless you have a compiler installed and you know what you're doing. Okay. You Yes, you are going to get that. So if you've installed the tidyverse and then you do library tidyverse, you're going to see some interesting sort of warning messages appear, which I'm going to talk about in a slide or two. Those are not really errors. Those are just telling you something useful, which I'm going to explain here in one sec. Okay, might take you a while for this to install, so I'm going to keep going. Um, but once it's done, you can do library tidyverse, assuming it hasn't run into any trouble, <clears throat> and you'll have these things loaded up. Okay, so. Today, we're just going to use dplyr and ggplot out of this. We're not going to use all the many other parts of the tidyverse. If you do library tidyverse or library dplyr, you're going to get a message in your console like she just displayed down there. You're going to get something that says like attaching package dplyr, and then you're going to see things like the following objects are masked from package stats and package base or it's going to say things like I loaded these specific packages, not others, and there's conflicts that exist. These are basically the same type of message. Okay, so to somebody new to R, that's going to look like an error, like maybe you broke something, maybe you did something wrong, and it's going to cause you anxiety. Okay, so that is not an error. This is a useful little message being told to you by R. The idea is that if you load a package in R, and you already have some functions that share the same names as things you've loaded, R has to overwrite them temporarily. This temporary overwriting of things with the same name is called masking. Okay, this message here is just letting you know it did it. If I go back to this prior slide, where it says here by loading dplyr, it has masked from package stats, filter and lag. This means if I run the filter function before running dplyr, it's going to run the filter function built into the base R stats package. If I run library dplyr after that, it would be running the filter command built into dplyr. They've got the same name, but only one of them can be loaded at once. So the new one from dplyr overwrites the old one for the duration of your current like, time working with R. This is not a bad thing. So, yeah, um, yeah. If you don't want those messages to appear in your like our Markdown document, uh, you can load your packages in a chunk and put on that chunk either message equals false or include equals false, and it will suppress those messages so you don't see them in your Markdown. This is why I like to use a setup chunk kind of at the top where I load my data and my packages, and I just set include equals false. 
and no one will ever know it's there. It hides everything. Okay. okay. So sometimes you get another warning message when you load packages. Sometimes you'll get a warning message that says something like, package gapminder was built under R version 3.5.3. This is a warning message letting you know your current version of R is out of date. This will normally be a ver R version here listed that is newer than the one you have. This is R just warning you that the package you downloaded, installed, and are now running expects a newer version of R, and potentially there could be incompatibilities with your current version. Usually there won't be, but it's just letting you know. Normally with this, you just want to update your R, but if you're too lazy to update your R for now, that's fine. You can also include equals false or message equals false when you load the package, and it will get rid of it in your R markdown doc. Okay. So now let's talk about actual dplyr code and show you the cool things it's going to let us do. So something that's nice about dplyr is it allows us to use Magritter pipe operators to pipe data between functions. This is the way we're going to write a lot of code in this class, and it's a more intuitive way than nesting functions. When I say nesting functions, I've already shown you how to write code like this. Maybe if what I want to do is I want to get the log of the average gapminder population value in the data set, I would have to say, take the gapminder data, extract the population variable, take the mean of that population variable and then log that mean of the population variable, right? This reads inside out because the first thing that gets run is this, then this, then this, then this, then this. Okay, so I'm not 100% sure, but I am not aware of any human languages that read inside out. There are many that read left to right or right to left, but there are not many that read inside out. So this is not intuitive to people to read. <clears throat> Pipes allow us to make things go left to right or right to left if you'd prefer. I'll usually show left to right because I'm used to English and it goes left to right. <clears throat> so we can pipe data like this. I can say, take the gapminder data set, specifically its population variable, and then get its mean, and then log it, okay? I will get the exact same value here as here. The main difference is this bottom one reads left to right. So if you have a lot of these things nested, it's really clear what's happening. It does this, and then it does this, and then it does this. So when you see a pipe, read it in your mind as the words and then, okay? I'm gonna try and use linguistic metaphors throughout this class for how to read code and how to translate it into English. A pipe is really just saying and then, <clears throat> okay? So reading things left to right or writing them left to right with pipes makes your code a little bit more readable for most people. It also gets a lot more readable when you have a lot of things piped. It's pretty common for me to have dozens or maybe even a hundred commands piped in a row in a single pipe chain. I like to write code like that because I don't like making intermediate objects. I can read my code left to right and top to bottom very easily this way. If you nested those things, it would be an impossible mess. So pipes are kind of nice. Okay. We're going to use these and we're going to talk a lot more about them later. So I'm just going to kind of show them and you'll gain some intuition for them and we'll dwell on them more next week. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example of doing a little bit of subsetting on our Gapminder data. I'm going to say, begin with the Gapminder data and then filter so that country is equal to Algeria. Okay. Uh, so there's a question in chat. To go right to left, you just change the direction. Yes, I don't think dplyr by default loads the left direction operator. So you might have to do library magreter to do that. Um, I've never really used the left operator. I've used the bidirectional operator pretty often, which sends things in both directions, which sounds weird, but sometimes there's some cases for it. Um, I almost always just use left or right. <clears throat> anyway. So this code right here says, take these data and then filter them so that this statement is true. So what is this really doing here? If you look here, you'll see every single one of the rows of data that result have a country value of Algeria. 
So what this statement has done is say, I can begin with a data frame and then I filter it. Filter means restrict the data to a subset of rows. What subset of rows do I want? I want only rows whose value of country is equal to Algeria. Filtering here is the same thing as filtering in Excel. It's a way to reduce your data set down. My data set now is only 12 observations because there's only 12 rows showing Algeria. Okay. So good question here you might have is what exactly does country equals equals Algeria do? What is this thing? And yes, and why is it double equals instead of one equals like was just asked in chat? It's an excellent question. Okay, so what is this doing here? So first I'm going to show you what it does and then I'm going to talk about why it's a double equals instead of a single. Okay, so what this thing has actually done is it has created a logical expression or a logical vector. If I run gapminder extract from it the country column and test whether these country column, this country column equals Algeria, if I look at the first 50 values of it, the result of this actual expression here is just a whole bunch of falses and trues. If you do something with equals equals or some other logical operator like this, I'm going to talk more about logical operators, the result of a logical expression like this is either a true or a false or a missing value for every thing that it tests. Okay. So this is a good question to in chat. What is the head function? Head gets the first n observations of something. So if I did gapminder dollar sign country equals Algeria, it's going to give me 1,704 values. The reason for that is there are 1,704 values to this, and it's going to test whether each one of them equals Algeria. I use head here just to show the first 50 because the values, the rows for Algeria are in the, within the first 50 observations of the data set because it's in alphabetical order. All of these falses here are the first countries which are not Algeria. These trues are lined up with the rows of the data where the country is Algeria. And then everything else in the data set is a false because it's not Algeria. What this test does here is it just produces a whole bunch of trues and falses. You could type right into your studio this statement, gapminder dollar sign country equals equals Algeria, and you're just going to see a whole bunch of trues and falses. This logical expression, this logical operator here, that's what it's for. You test some statement. You're saying basically, gapminder dollar sign country is equal to Algeria. Is this a true or is this a false statement? And it tests it for every value in the data. The way filter works is filter converts these trues and falses into subset in your data. Any place a false lines up with the row, it deletes the row. Any place a true lines up, it keeps it. And it, it gives to you as a result only the things a true lined up with. In other words, only the 12 observations associated with Algeria. We're going to play with this a lot and you'll get an intuition for it. Okay. So we did this in lab before with the subset operator, the brackets, and it does the same thing. It gives you the observations that line up with a statement. If you were in lab, you saw me do something like uh, Swiss dollar sign Catholic is greater than 51.4 or 41.4 or something. What that did is it returned a true anytime Catholic was above that number, a false otherwise. Once you put it into either filter or a subset operator, it drops all the ones that line up with a false, keeps all the ones that line up with a true, and that's how subsetting data works in R. Technically, it's also the way subsetting data works in Excel. Okay, so why is it a double equals, you asked? So the reason it's a double equals is double equals is a special operator specifically for testing if the thing on the left side equals the thing on the right side. A single equals is for making the thing on the left side equal to the thing on the right. So equals, a single one, is equivalent to the assignment operator in R. You can use it to create objects or more often use it to assign arguments inside of a function. Double equals is different. It's for doing logical tests. So there's a lot of these logical tests you can do. Okay, They're all done with different operators. 
there's not equal to. If instead of double equals, I do exclamation point equals, this is the opposite of equal equal. This returns a true whenever the thing on the, on the left is not equal to the thing on the right, otherwise it's a false. There's also greater than, greater than, and equal, less than, less than, and equal for doing numeric comparisons. There's also percent in. This is used for checking if the thing on the left is equal to any one of multiple values on the right. I'll show some examples of using that. We can also combine these things together using special operators for combining logical conditions. We used and in lab, I think maybe, I'm not positive. This says both conditions need to hold. So if you have a logical thing like country equals equals Algeria and year equals equals 2007, the only rows you're gonna get in your data are Algeria in 2007. There's also or operator. An or says either thing needs to hold. If I did country equals equals Algeria or year equals 2007, I would get every year observation of Algeria and then I would get every 2007 observation of every other country. I'll show you some, uh, pi, some Venn diagrams of this in a second. Okay, there's also exclamation point on its own. Exclamation point will invert any logical condition. So if you do some tests like country equals equals Algeria and you put an exclamation point in front of it, it becomes the same as country is not equal to Algeria. This is a way to invert a statement. Sometimes it's easier to think of a way to not select something that you want than to actually directly select it. So just not select it and then reverse it. I'll show you examples of this in lab throughout the term. Okay, we're gonna use these continually throughout the class. So don't worry about memorizing them. The best way to learn them is to just use them over the course of the term and we'll see. So there's a question. Could you show how to write Gapminder filter country equals equals Algeria using nesting? I absolutely can. And that is a fantastic question. So I'll show you. Okay. So if I have my Gapminder data here, I can filter down. Oh, well, I haven't loaded the tidyverse or dplyr. So it's upset with me. This is that message she asked about in chat before. This just says when I load library tidyverse, it's actually loading these packages and it's saying it's overriding these functions already. Okay. If I run this Gapminder filter Algeria, I'm going to get only the observations for Algeria. If I wanted to write this using nesting, I could essentially take this right here and put Gapminder inside of it. And those are equivalent. So what the pipe is actually doing, as I'll show next week, is the pipe is taking this thing on the left and making it the first argument of the function on the right. That's all it's doing. It becomes real handy though when you want to run a lot of stuff sequentially, which you're going to see a lot of examples of in this class. Okay, awesome question. Okay, <clears throat> let's start using the stuff. Or actually, no, I think I got a diagram first. No, multiple conditions first. Okay, so maybe we want to run multiple statements simultaneously. Like I said, you can use the AND operator for. We can do it. So maybe what I want is I want to get all of the observations specifically for the country Oman and only after the year 1980. I can say, take my Gapminder data and then filter it so that the country is equal to Oman and the year is above 1980. What I get are only values where country is Oman and only years after 1980. This is an and statement. Right? Both of these things must be true to get it, and thus I only get these six observations, because there's only six observations in the data that satisfy both of these conditions simultaneously. Okay, so to compare these things, if I say Gapminder and then filter so that country is equal to Oman and year is greater than 1980, this is what I've done. I've said, okay, there's a whole world of observations for which the country is Oman and a whole world where the year is greater than 1980. But I only want the intersection of these things. I want the rows where the country is Oman and the year is after 1980 and discard anything that doesn't satisfy both of those simultaneously. Alternately, I could use the OR operator. If I say, take the Gapminder data and then filter so that the country is Oman or the year is greater than 1980, 
I'm going to get every observation where the country is Oman, regardless of the year, and I'm going to get every observation where the year is at least 1980, regardless of the country. Okay, so if you have trouble thinking about the ver difference between an and or an or, think about a Venn diagram. If you're really having a tough pro time, draw the Venn diagram and you'll get an idea of what you're getting. Okay, I like to think about these things visually because that's how my brain works. If you have something else that works for you, you can think about it. I actually did have a student a long while back who literally just sort of thought about them in terms of uh, like logic, which means computer programming came easy to them and they didn't need to be in my class. But if you think visually instead, this might help. Any questions about that? <clears throat> One of those teaching tricks is to ask a question when what you really want to do is chug a lot of coffee. Okay. <clears throat> Next thing we might want to do, maybe you want to filter your data down, subset it to something, but you want to use that subset multiple times. Rather than subsetting down every single time you want to use that particular thing, you could subset it and then save it as something. So here, as an example, what I want to do is I want to take my Gapminder data and then filter it down so that the country is China but I wanna keep using the data from China over and over again. So I'm going to assign the output of this entire statement. I assign it to the object China. <clears throat> so you'll note if I do a statement like this with, a, with pipes, I can do the assignment here at the beginning and I can run as many pipes as I want afterwards. I still can do the assignment up here at the beginning. This, in my opinion, is actually pretty intuitive because what you're saying is you think to yourself first the thing you want to make. I want to make an object called China and I'm going to stuff the China data in it. So I'm going to create China and then I'm going to assign to it. What am I going to assign to it? Then I worry about how to make the thing. Then I say, well, to make it, I had to take my Gapminder data and filter it this way. But maybe I had to do a lot of stuff to it. I still would do the assignment up here. Okay. So. If I do this and I get head, I look at China, it's first four observations. I see the observations I have are entirely from China. Okay, so it appears to have worked, but now instead of having to do this statement every time, I can just refer to the China object. It's there and I can use it. Okay, so now I've shown you some basic subsetting, some basic plotting. I'm going to move now to the ggplot unit of our lecture. <laughs> So let's talk about base R plots and then compare them to our GG plots we're going to work with. So the base R plots we saw last week looks something like this. I could say I want a plot of life expectancy on year using my China data. I dress it up with an X axis label of year, a Y axis label of life expectancy a main title of life expectancy in China. I make the dots red. I make the labels a little bit bigger. I make the title a little bit bigger and I make the dots size 16. So this is something where I kind of was finicky. I manually set a whole bunch of different things to make a very bare bones plot over here. Okay, this is a base R plot. Okay, this is possibly the last base R plot you will see in this entire course. I think I'll probably do a couple in the lab because it's sometimes fast for some things. This is one of the last ones. What I'm going to do is show you how to replicate this using ggplot and then build on top of it. Okay, so ggplot, which I keep talking about, is an alternative way of plotting that many people, myself included, prefer over base R plots for almost all types of plots. There are a couple of things I still like base R plots for. So we can load up ggplot if you've installed the tidyverse. You can load it up with library ggplot2. Okay. The idea underlying ggplot is something called the layered grammar of graphics. The idea behind this is that you can break up elements of a plot into separate pieces and combine them together almost like a language, sort of a, a language of plotting things. If you'd like to know more about this, there's actually, it's, this goes back to um, old articles, which didn't originate with Hadley Wickham, but he's one of the people who's popularized it. This layered grammar of graphics, there's journal articles out there if you're curious. <clears throat> okay, um, so the idea is we can break these things up um, into a powerful language for assembling plots piece by piece in an iterative fashion. Okay, 
So here's an example of basically the same plot of the China data in ggplot instead of in base R. This has a different syntax to it. I say here, we're going to make a ggplot. The data we're going to use to make this plot are the China data. Then I have a weird thing here, AES. X is equal to year. Y is equal to life expectancy plus geom point. So without knowing anything about ggplot, you could probably figure out x equals year and y equals life expectancy are putting year on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis. This thing here is an aesthetic function, which you use to map your data onto stuff. I'm going to talk a lot about this in a minute. But basically, this is the way you tell ggplot what you want on its axes. But it's also how you tell ggplot how to color things and stuff like that. A thing that's different about ggplot versus base R plots is that you add together separate function calls with plus signs. This is an entire function call. If you run this on its own, it will indeed generate a plot. It won't have any dots on it, but it will generate a plot. If I want some dots on it, I say plus G on point, and then it will draw the scatter plot points. Okay. So it's not important to know how this works yet, because you're going to get too much detail on how this works, and then lots of examples for the rest of this lecture. But this just shows you the basic syntax. <clears throat> okay. So. Let's talk about some language and structure of these before we put it into action. So I'm going to put the boring part of this first, which is telling you the precise language of ggplot, and then we're going to draw lots of pretty pictures. So ggplot graphics consist of two primary components. They consist of something called layers. The layers are the actual visible objects you see on the graph. These are things we add together using plus signs on the ggplot. This will be things like the lines, the shapes, and the text you see on the plot. Also, it's background if there is one. These are layers. They're the actual visible components. There are also aesthetics. Aesthetics are what determine how those layers look or how they appear. So with layers, we add them to a plot. With aesthetics, we set them using arguments. For instance, you might say, color equals red inside a layer, and it will make that layer red. <clears throat> okay? Aesthetics include things like the locations that your dots and lines are, the colors of your dots and lines, and the sizes of your dots and lines. Aesthetics can also be told to map your data onto appearances. By mapping, it means things like saying a column in your data will determine the location of your lines and your points, a column in your data will determine their colors, or a column in your data will determine their sizes. So we set things if we want them all to be the same, we map them if we want them to vary based on values in our data. We'll see lots of examples of both of these. Okay, so as far as layers go, there are a lot of different layers that you can put on a ggplot graph. These are things like the initial layer, ggplot. This initializes the plot and generates its axes and plots a background to it. Geom point draws scatter plot points. Geom line makes lines. The title, the X and Y labels, if you want to manually modify them, are actually layers that draw text on it. There's also weird layers like facet wrap, which I'll show in a bit. This is a layer that stratifies your graph into multiple graphs. It turns one plot into many plots. It's a layer, but it's a weird kind of layer. Facet grid does this and assembles a grid of different plots. There's also layers which are themes. Themes do things like change the background, change the fonts, change the color of things for the entire plot to style the whole plot. There's a few built-in themes in ggplot, but you can go and download lots of other ones if you like them to look like particular things. All layers you add to a ggplot are separated by plus signs. For clarity, I usually tend to put each one of these layers on its own line in the code. Sometimes I put ones that are really short arguments on the same line, so I'm not eating up tons of space. But all of these will be separated by plus signs because you're adding layers on to previous objects. OK. Aesthetics. Aesthetics are for controlling the appearance of the layers. 
Aesthetics will be things like your X and Y coordinates. These X and Y coordinates will determine where the points are in your scatter plot or where the lines are, or where the text is. Color will set the color of those points or those lines in that text. Group is an aesthetic that tells ggplot you want certain points of data conceptually linked together. This is something you would do if you want, for instance, your lines to connect through countries or continents in your data, rather than you're just line connecting every single point to every other single point on a plot. There's also aesthetics for controlling the size of things and alpha being the transparency. Here's an excellent question in chat. I'm confused. What is the difference between ggplot and ggplot2? ggplot and ggplot2 are terms you will hear me and most people use interchangeably. ggplot2 is the actual name of the package because it was the second complete um, sort of attempt at making it. The first one wasn't very successful and was sort of a uh, blueprint for it um, and doesn't really exist maintained anymore. But ggplot2 is just what it's called. I don't know why they haven't just straight up replaced the original one with ggplot2. I don't know why, but ggplot2 is what it is. If you hear me say ggplot or anyone say ggplot, they mean ggplot2. Um, it's just called ggplot2. Okay. Okay. So, talking about aesthetics, there's two ways to use aesthetics they are setting and they are mapping. So layers will take arguments you use to control their appearance, such as the location or color of things or their transparency. There's two different ways to make something look a particular way. Arguments like color, size, line type, shape, fill, alpha, all of these can be used directly on a layer. You can do something like G on point color equals red. This is called setting an aesthetic. And setting an aesthetic means, in this case, every single point drawn by this layer will be a red point. Every dot will be red. If you use a setting aesthetic like this, they don't depend on your data. Regardless of what your data are, they'll all be the same thing like red. Okay. Contrast this with mapping aesthetics. If you set an argument like color inside of the AES function, it will then depend on values in your data. If I say G on point AES color equals continent, this will make it so that every dot on my plot is a different color for each continent in my data. So this is for mapping the color of your dots onto a variable like continent. This is for just setting them all to be the same. This is setting, this is mapping, okay? So <clears throat> the idea with AES, AES is for mapping variables onto appearances. You can actually map in ggplot layer, the very first layer of a plot. If you use AES, you can set overall aesthetics that every other layer in the plot will use by default. Okay. And you'll see me do this in a minute where I will do AES X equals something Y equals something in the original ggplot call, and then it will get inherited by all the, lay the later layers. <clears throat> that might sound complicated now. You'll intuitively get used to doing it, and you'll see a lot of examples from me. <clears throat> okay. So all of the stuff I just talked about might seem pedantic. It might be like, well, it's important to talk about the difference between a setting and a mapping aesthetic and the difference between a layer and an aesthetic. Okay, the reason I'm giving you this is this precise language makes it much easier to Google for help. When you break something in a plot, you don't know how to fix it. If you use the precise language, you will find the Stack Overflow answer that answers your question. If you don't know the language, it's hard to search for answers. So precise language is useful to you. It also helps asking me for help too, but I usually know what people mean. Okay, so I've told you the jargon. Let's draw some pictures. So let's start with a base plot. So what I'm going to say here is I'll make a plot. Because I'm going to make a plot, I'm going to begin with the function ggplot. I'm going to use my data equals China. I'm going to use my data from China. I'm going to say my aesthetic x equals year, y equals life expectancy. This is going to create a blank canvas. My blank canvas shows me year here, life expectancy here, and literally nothing else. Because this function call by itself just creates a canvas for us. I haven't drawn any dots, any lines, anything like that. 
But what ggplot has done is it has gotten the limits of my y axis and my limits of my x axis from the data. The minimum value of year in the data is 1952. The maximum is 2007. So it's generated realistic limits here, but it hasn't plotted any data. Okay. This is a mapping aesthetic where I have mapped X onto year and Y onto life expectancy. Okay. It's getting them from the real data. Now what I want to do, I want to make some dots. So I'm going to say, take my base plot, add some dots. I say plus G on point. Now I got some dots. Where did it get the locations of these dots from? It inherited AES X equals year life, Y equals life expectancy. So it drew the X location of the dots on the years, the Y location on the life expectancies. So this is the overtime values of year and life expectancy in China. So all I had to do was add G on point and I got some dots. This is adding a layer that's a scatter plot layer. Okay. Ah, so the AES is not the labels. The AES is giving the labels, but it's doing more than that. It's actually telling ggplot where to find the thing to get the labels and place the data on the plot. So doing more than just the labels. It's referencing saying anything regarding the x-axis is coming from the year column. Anything regarding the y-axis is coming from life expectancy. So it's getting the titles, the axis values, and the locations of the data from these columns. Next thing I want to do, well, let's make some big red dots. So what I've done here is I've said G on point, but then I've set some aesthetics. I've said I want the color to be red and the size is three. These don't depend on the data. These are setting aesthetics. They are the same for every single point on the plot. They are all size three red dots. They don't depend on the data. I haven't mapped anything. And also that means they're not in AES because I've set them manually, okay? Next thing I want to do, let's change my X label. All I want to do is capitalize it. So I said, see it's lowercase here. I can do capital Y year. So here's a question. Don't we have to write AES before color? No, the reason for it is it's AES is when you want to get the values from a variable in your data. If you just want to set it manually so it's the same across all of them, you don't put it in aesthetic, you don't put an AES, you just say what you want on the layer and it applies it directly to it. Okay. That's the difference with AES. AES is for mapping it onto the data. These things, red and size three, aren't in our China object. We just set them right here. Okay, I'm also going to clean up my Y axis label. I change it from being life exp, which is the default name of the variable here. I change it to life expectancy, clean it up. So X label layer, Y label layer. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a title. I say life expectancy in China, GG title, life expectancy in China adds up here. Then I'm going to change the theme. The entire look of the plot can be changed by saying plus theme black and white. This gets a little of the, uh, the ugly gray default background, whites it out a little bit, gives it a outline around the plot area. You know, it's kind of clean. It looks okay. I probably wouldn't use it for like publication, but it looks okay for now, okay? Now, another thing about this though, my text is a little bit small here. I could add into my theme layer base size equals 18 and it's going to up the font size for all of the text on the plot. So base size, you'll notice, it increases every piece of text size in a uniform proportional way. This title stays larger than the rest of the text, but it gets bigger. The axis, axis marks get bigger. These labels get bigger. So base size is a way to scale all of the text in the plot that's around sort of the uh, margins and stuff. Okay. Ah, so here's a good question. Why do you use plus here instead of pipe? The reason I use plus here is that's what ggplot uses to link things together. Hadley Wickham to this day regrets not just using it with a pipe format, but it would be a huge pain to change it so they don't. Maybe some future version will use pipes instead, but ggplot is older than the Magreeter operator, and so they were using plus back in the day. So you just use pluses to add them together and not pipes. It's just a thing you have to worry. Okay. Ah, so here's a question. 
I think this might be on the previous slide. How do we know what options there are for themes and colors? For themes, if you start typing theme underscore in your console and hit tab, you'll get a like a, a list of all the themes. There aren't many built into ggplot. You could also do question mark ggplot and go to its documentation and look them up. Might be another thing. As far as colors go, there's a lot of colors in R. So if you want named colors, named colors, there's a ton. I forget the actual function you type in to get the list of them, but there's like thousands. Um, basically, if you can think of a common color name, you can probably punch it in there and get it. Okay. Um, yeah, you can also give it hexadecimal codes. If you're used to using hex color codes, like you're an old internet person or something, I just use hex codes and dial them in. Okay. You can also have it automatically generate palettes using functions, things like that. Okay. So now we got a basic plot that looks kind of good for our China data. So what if we like this plot we made for China? We're like, that's a good plot. But I would like that plot to be all of the countries in the Gapminder data set and not just China. Well, let's see what happens if we take the plot we just made, but instead of giving it the China data, we give it everything. Okay, so this is the exact same syntax as before. All I've done is I've changed the data to be data equals Gapminder. What we're going to get is we're going to get a mess. There's nothing wrong with this. It's not digestible by a human, but it's not the most useful thing in the world. So the issue here is that we've drawn a scatter plot dot for every country year observation of life expectancy. Well, there's 142 countries. So there's 142 dots at each one of these years. We can't tell our countries apart. We can't see any trends or anything. We just have a whole bunch of lines here. Okay. So maybe we could follow our not lines, but a whole bunch of dots. Maybe instead we could follow some lines over time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this from G on point to geom line. I've left everything else the same. Okay. Well, now we got some lines, right? We do have some lines, but ggplot doesn't know how to connect the lines between all of the different countries. Instead, what it's doing is it's running one line through every single observation, just kind of left to right. This is a useless, hideous plot. What we got to do is we got to tell ggplot how to draw the lines. The way we want to draw the lines is to make it so each country gets its own line. There's a way to tell ggplot to do that. What we do is we add up in our aesthetic group equals country. I can add this up here in the top level ggplot call. If I had an AES and geom line, I could add it there instead. It'll work in either place. I put it up here in ggplot group equals country. We go from this thing here to this thing here. Well, we can tell, even though the lines are way too big, that they were at least probably tracking through individual countries. By and large, you can see they're just sort of running left to right. It kind of looks like somebody took a whole bunch of fresh spaghetti and laid it on the table and messed a couple pieces up. Okay. The issue here is the lines are too thick. So what we can do here is we can reel back in this size equals three on geom line and remove it. It defaults back to size equals one, whatever that means. And now we have thinner red lines. Ah, this is already much better. We can see individual lines for countries, their life expectancies over time. In most countries that don't experience really traumatic nationwide events, life expectancies tend to be sort of stably waving up and down and going upward over time. Okay, so this is better. But maybe something that might be useful is if we highlighted, say, regional differences. We wouldn't want to assign a different color for every country because there's 142 of them. Good luck telling apart 142 colors on a plot. But what we might be able to do is tell apart the different continents, say, if we colored each continent a different way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dump color equals red here and instead add color equals continent. I put it up here in the original AES for the overall plot, just because that's where I'm doing my aesthetics. The idea is geom line inherits these values here, so I can put them up here and it just gets them by default. So what this does here now is I can see trends by continent. Each country is still its own line, but the colors are done by all the different continents in our data. So we might get a little bit better idea how things are laid, are sort of like going on across uh, these different countries in the world. Patterns are a little more obvious here. 
The thing is, though, is this plot is still a little bit hard to read. It might be better, instead of plotting every single continent on one plot, to break out different plots for each continent. Now, in if you were using base R and you weren't super savvy with like the lattice package in base R, um, you might be like, well, it's kind of a pain to go and plot five different like uh, plots over here. So here's a question. Did it add the code for the colors automatically to the side? Yes, it did. So what it did is it read all the values of continent, added a little legend over here and correctly mapped their colors on. It's totally automatic. It generates legends for you based on the data you give to it. I don't have to do anything fancy. It takes care of legends for me. It's one of those nice ggplot things, okay? So, so what I want to do now, let's instead break this out into multiple plots so my continents aren't overlapping each other. In ggplot, this is trivial. What I do is I add a single layer to the bottom. I go from here to here. I say, let's add facet wrap by continent. What facet wrap does is facet wrap takes your data, breaks it up by some categorical variable and makes one of each of these type of plots, all the code here, one for each value of continent. So now I have the values for Africa all plotted here, the Americas here, Asia here, and so on, right? Each one gets its own plot. Faceting is really cool because often you want to break up your stuff and just visualize it like this. Uh, if you have a lot of values for this, it'll just plot as many as you ask for. This is a thing called small multiples. If you take a class like Chris Adolph's visualization class, this is a really nice thing for displaying a lot of information in a consistent way across many uh, big data sets, basically. Okay, so the issue here now is I've plotted out all these little multiples, but my text is a little bit too big, things overlap, they're kind of ugly. I can reel back in my base size 18 by deleting it, and now I'm at the default font sizes, and it's a little bit more readable. My legends here are readable, my labels look like a more realistic size. This plot's already a little bit better. A thing about this plot, though, is my legend is sitting way over here on the right. So plots, like most images you might generate, um, they are rectangular, right? So this actual image is this big, but it goes all the way out to here and up here. There's all this white space here and white space here I'm technically wasting. A thing about this plot is there's five panels. I have a big open spot right here. If I wanted to keep my legend, something I could do is drag this legend in and buy myself some space back. So. I add a call to theme. Theme is a very general ggplot function used for those finicky manipulations of every little thing on the plot. One of those little things you might want to modify is the position of the legend. I say here, my legend position should be 0 0.8 and 0 0.25. This right here is coordinates. This says my legend should be 80% of the way up the x-axis and 25% of the way up the y-axis. That is approximately in the middle of this omitted panel. You might ask how I got those numbers. I played with it until it looked good. Okay, So this is a way to bring it in. So if you wanted that legend, you could bring it in here and you'll notice it's a lot better. We gained some white space back. Our plot looks better. We've lost nothing in the process. But we actually already have labels for all of our continents at the top of our facets, which were automatically generated by ggplot. I don't even really need my continent uh, legend here. I could say instead of legend position equals 0 0.8, 0 0.25, <coughs> legend position equals none. It's the same plot with no legend. Okay? So you can delete them. You can move them around. Theme has a lot of things you can do. If you do question mark theme, you'll see it has like hundreds of things you can do. You don't want to like memorize it. It's the kind of thing where when you think of something you really need to do on a plot, you go look it up or hunt down and find it. I memorize some of them that I use a lot, but I don't remember the rest of them. Okay. So that's sort of the basic nuts and bolts of building plots in ggplot. It's very powerful, it's very flexible, it's very easy to do things that are sometimes complicated in other software, like lots of repeated plots of the same thing, stuff like that. The syntax is actually pretty easy for it. Any questions of any kind?
We're going to play with more stuff too. It's going to get more complicated. Okay. I'll keep chugging on. So, maybe you want to store your plots. You want to save them in some way. So, you can assign a ggplot object uh, or ggplot plot to an object like anything else in R. Everything in R is an object, so you can generally assign it to something and keep it. So, I could say, I want to take this plot I just generated on the previous slide. I'm going to save it to an object called life exp by year. I assign to it that whole ggplot call. If you do this, it's not going to display the plot because what it's going to do is it's going to capture that output and stuff it in this life exp by year object so I can use it later. Okay, I could then save this if I wanted as an object, but it's not the I'm not saving the image. I'm actually saving the things necessary to build the image. Okay, the neat thing about doing that is let's say I have sort of a foundation for a plot, but I want to modify things on it for future plots. If I save the output of this ggplot to this, I can display it like this. If I do life exp by year, the plot will pop out. But I could do something like add another layer to this saved object. If I then add my legend position back, my legend will appear. So you can sort of save templates or foundational plots like this and add things back to them later. So you don't have to duplicate writing all that code you did earlier. Just a thing to know about. Okay. Other things you might want to do, there's layers to do things like modify the axes on your plots. You can change the limits, like how wide the plot is left and right, up and down. You can have it automatically calculate a logarithmic or square root scale if you want to see like log linear relationships. You can change where the breaks are. The breaks are where the little tick marks and labels are at. You can manually modify all those things. Okay, here's an example. I'm going to take a ggplot of my China data, x equals year, y equals GDP per capita. Knowing a little bit about GDP per capita, I might expect GDP per capita is not going to increase in a linear fashion, but rather a logarithmic fashion. GDP per capita tends to increase multiplicatively instead of linearly. So I'm going to say, let's make a line plot of it. But let's change the scale on the y-axis to be scale y log 10. This puts it in a base 10 logarithmic scale. So if I look over here, my values go 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and 5,000. Okay? They are narrower the higher up you get because that's how a logarithm works. This is nice for displaying things with log linear relationships. Now notice over here on my y-axis, it's not just showing the numbers. It's showing a thousand dollars and zero zero cents. This is me playing around with some special features I want you to know about in scales. I'm saying here first, the breaks where I want the labels on the y-axis to be are at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and 5,000, which is why they're there. But then I want their labels to be automatically modified by ggplot for me. By doing, I do this like this. I say I would like the labels equal to inside the scales package is a function called dollar. What it will do is it will take numbers like these and it will put a dollar sign in front of them, a comma before every three zeros and a cents position. So instead of manually figuring out a way to generate that, I'm saying go use the scales package to make the y-axis in dollars. If you want to do this, something like this yourself, steal this code to do it. Maybe check other things in the scales package. It has a lot of cool options for making nice axes like this. I also changed the x limit. So it goes all the way back to 1940, even though there's no data, and all the way to 2010, even though there's no data. And then I gave it a nice title. Okay, it's the kind of thing you might want to do on plots in the Gapminder data on your homework or something. You don't have to, but these are some options to play around with or use in the future. Okay, so other things you might want to do. Again, I'll just show you again. Maybe the fonts were too small for us here. I did that base size equals 20 in the theme and it changed the size of everything. Now it's really big. If your eyesight is like my eyesight, maybe you want really big fonts. It's a thing you can do. Okay, so in ggplot, you can tweak just about everything you want. Very small, minor things can all be modified. 
Dang. So if you want to modify individual text sizes, labels, tick marks, all that kind of stuff, you can modify those things very precisely using that theme layer I talked about before. I generally recommend always putting the theme layer last in your ggplot call because some things can override its settings. I say put it last. Things you might do in it. Here's an example. Maybe I want a really big title and I want it left aligned. I might say in my theme layer, plot title equals element text, make it size relative to, says make it twice as big, h just zero left justifies something. If you want a centered title, you could say h just equals 0 0.5. If you want it right justified, it would be h just equals 1. This is horizontal justification. Okay? You can do all sorts of other things. Maybe you want your axis labels rotated. I think I have an example of this later, so I won't show you here. Generally, you can rotate text on your labels and your tick marks. You could make things different colors. You could change the lengths of tick marks, all that kind of stuff. So here's a question. How to change the size of only titles, not all data. Can we do that? That is exactly this up here. If you wanted to change just the like title, you could say plot.title equals element text size this. It'll change the size of the title. You could also say, I forgot what it is for the actual labels themselves. They're, um, it's not x.label. I forgot. I'd have to look it up in theme. But you can manually adjust literally all the text without modifying the data. So you could mess with theme, might be something you play with in your homework. You don't have to, but it's a useful thing to master if you want to make like publication ready plots where you have little finicky changes to make. Okay. So other things that are important to know about, I showed you a scale a bit ago, but didn't talk about it too much. There are a lot of options for scales in ggplot. Scales follow a general format in the way the function is named, like scale a particular aesthetic it sets a scale for and a particular option for how it sets that aesthetic okay examples of this are things like scale line type manual is a scale for manually specifying what type of lines every like observation or every value of a variable takes on your plot scale alpha Continuous is a scale to modify or vary transparency, which is the alpha layer in graphics terms. Modify transparency using a continuous variable. There's also scales like scale, color, brewer, which is a scale for setting colors to color brewer palette values. Color brewer is a uh, package in R based on a um, stuff from a website, essentially, for setting specific palettes that are sometimes nice for different purposes, <clears throat> okay? There are a million of these scales. There's way too many for me to list out there, but just know that anything you want to set on your plot probably has an associated scale if you want to modify the way it looks, okay? If you have questions about how to do it, hit the Slack channel or, or uh, the emailing list and we'll talk about, or hit lab and we'll talk about different types of scales, okay? Normally, I just Google what I want if I can't remember. Okay. So here's an example of using a scale to set some manual colors, in this case, hideous manual colors. So what I did is I took my life exp by year plot from before. I added that legend back and stuffed it in the bottom right. But then I did a scale for the color of things on the plot where I'm going to manually set their values. Scale color manual. In scales, you can also change the name displayed on the legend. I said the name of the legend should be which continent are we looking at, which generates which continent are we looking at as the name of the legend. Backslash n here is line break. So it says which continent are we on the first line, line break, we looking at there. It's a way to add in line breaks in your uh, things like that. And then what I did is for scale color manual, I set my values manually. I say here, I want a vector. This vector is something called a named vector. Named vectors contain a name of an element and then the element itself. The name of the element is the thing I want this color assigned to. So I'm saying the lines associated with Africa, 
should be sea green, just in our color. The lines associated with the Americas should be turquoise one, Asia, royal blue, and so on, okay? So what this does is it makes it so all these lines for Africa, they're sea green, these are all turquoise, these are royal blue, these are violet red, and these are yellow. This is a manual legend. If you're finicky and you want to manually set values, this is how you would do it. ggplot has its own defaults it picks out. You could also have ggplot set it automatically, but to a different palette if you want. There's ones that will pick different palettes, for instance, that have the same luminosity and stuff like that. Anyway, I ask on the homework, you set at least one manual legend. You could do something like this, but you could also do something crazier like I'm going to show you in a minute. Okay. So here's an example of a ugly, massive code plot that we're going to walk through that has a bunch of manual stuff in it to give you an idea of sort of how much stuff you could manually set to do weird, finicky plots. This isn't necessarily the most elegant syntax to do this, but it's an example of something you could do. Okay, before I show you the plot, I'm going to highlight a few weird things in this plot syntax. Okay, this is really big. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Something you'll notice here is there are two different geom line calls. Okay, so there's a single geom line here, which I've made partially transparent. It says AES is color is equal to country in quotes, its size is equal to country in quotes. This is a weird thing, which we're going to see in a minute what I'm doing. There's another geom line over here, which uses a smooth, a lowest smoother, which is a way of drawing a line through the average of a bunch of points. It is drawn through the average of continents. I have some faceting. I have manually set colors. I have some weird stuff in the legend, like rotated text. Okay, there's a lot of manual stuff in here. It's okay to look at this and be like, that looks terrible, and I don't want to write things that look like that. Don't worry, you will eventually. Inevitably, your ggplot code gets really big if you're finicky about how your plots look, but I'll show you what this looks like. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to begin with the base layer in this plot. The base layer is ggplot, the gapminder data. My aesthetic is x year, y life expectancy. So x is year, y is life expectancy. I've grouped on country, but this doesn't actually do anything yet. It's just going to make it so when I draw some lines, those lines go through the values of country. Next, I add geom line. This is actually the same lines we saw before. There's one line for each country in the data. I haven't colored them or anything, so it's just a mess of black lines. Okay? So, no lines, lines. Next thing I'm going to do, I add another set of lines, which are very hard to see. You'll just barely see them appear. I say here, geom line, stat equals smooth, method equals low S, AES group equals continent. What this has done is it's drawn something called a low S curve through the middle of all of the individual continents. So what this has done is it's basically drawn a, it's roughly like a regression line drawn through the middle of the observations for each continent, except it's allowed to be bendy. It's invisible right now because I haven't set its colors, but you're going to see it in a minute. This is a way to do a line which is a summary of your data. This is an average line continent level averages of life expectancy. So it's going through the middle of all the countries. Okay, next, I facet it out. So this is the same faceting we did before. I say facet wrap, facet by continent. Here I specified number of rows equals two just to make sure it didn't attempt to generate three rows and make my plot too tall. If you need to specify exactly how many rows or columns you want in your facets, you can say n call or n row, and it gives you some fine control over how many plots to make. Next, I'm going to do something fancy here. So I've actually only added one line of code, scale, color, manual, but I've modified and added color statements up here and here. This is a way of doing manual legends. I don't expect you to master anytime soon, but it's something powerful. What I've said here is my scale color manual, 
I'm going to name my color scale life expectancy four and life expectancy four. That's the new legend down here. I'm going to set manual values. My manual values say any line for country is going to be a black line and any line for continents is going to be a blue line. Okay. Then I went up here and said, geom line, the first one, which is the country level data, aesthetic, set its color equals country. This is not actually a setting aesthetic. This is a mapping aesthetic of a weird type. What it's doing here is it's going to, when it gets to scale color manual, scale color manual is going to go back up to these geom lines and say, where color is equal to country, I assign the value black. Where color is equal to continent, I assign the color blue. This is weird, but what it does is this down here. I now have a black line for each country and a blue line for the continent. You notice the blue line is on top of the black lines. In ggplot, things are actually plotted in the order of the commands in the ggplot. I made my continent lines after my country lines, so they're on top of them. Okay, so here's a question chat. Stat equals smooth, that's a code for regression lines, but it's also a code for low S lines. Low S is a local polynomial smoother. It's a type of um, smoothed polynomial regression line. So it's going through the average level of life expectancy for all of these countries, but it's allowed to bend. It's not allowed to bend perfectly, but it's allowed to bend a lot. Okay? So this is essentially the year level average of life expectancy in Africa, the Americas, Asia, and so on. Okay? If you take Chris Adolph's class for visualization, he actually talks a lot about GAM models and low S curves. I love GAM models, but I won't get into them in this class. Okay, so this is a fancy way of mapping a color scale onto multiple types of geometry here. I would recommend playing with this a little bit, but don't map, figure out that you're, it's okay to not understand what's going on. Here. This is an example of something quite complicated. Okay, so next thing I want to do scale size manual. Scale size manual here, I'm actually doing the exact same thing I just did in scale color manual. I say name life expectancy four. If you name two legends the same thing, they combine into a single legend. This legend life expectancy four displays both the color and the size of the lines I've assigned. I say here my values, country is going to have lines 0.25 wide, continent is going to have lines three wide. So what I end up with is a big thick average line for continents and tiny lines for all the different countries. It's again mapped up here, color equals country, size equals country. These text again up here is saying, I want you to figure out your color by going down to scale color manual and looking up something named country. It goes to values, it looks up country, and it assigns black to it. It's a type of lookup table if you're already a programmer. Don't know why you're in this class if you know about lookup tables, but that's what it's doing. Okay. Next, I do a slight modification. Right up here at the top, all I do is for this geom line, alpha equals 0 0.5. Okay. Alpha 0 0.5 to the geom lines makes them partially transparent. It makes it a little easier to see overlapping data, and it lets me see the lines behind the average smooth line. When you got a lot of data on a plot, I often like to make it partially transparent so that you can see things stacked on top of each other. Next, I add a theme minimal. Base size 14 modifies the text size just a little bit. And then I add Y label as years. X label I remove. We don't care. I don't know Y label as years when it should be life expectancy over there. That's me inserting a typo into my slides because I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. Okay. So I do that. Next, I add a title up at the top. I say, my GG title is Life Expectancy 1952 to 2007, subtitle by continent and country. You can do subtitles in your GG titles, 
it's a good way to have an overall title and then something else like this be like I've subset it by these things. And then I say theme axis text dot x equals element text angle 45, which is the wordy way of making my axis tick labels here go from overlapping to being at a 45 degree angle. In my opinion, I generally prefer to just have fewer of them rather than to have them at a 45 degree angle, but I want to show you how to rotate text if you feel like doing that. Okay, so we rotate them out and I think that's almost the last thing. Yeah, all I do next is I do the same legend.position equals that and I draw the legend in to the blank space in here. And now what we have is we have this overall plot, which I don't think is super pretty, but it gives us every country level observation of life expectancy over time with a continent level average through the center of it. So here's a question. Can you repeat what the C means in values here? C is combined. C is for creating vectors. The vector I've created here, for instance, I'll show you what it is. If you take this text, C, country equals black, continent equals blue. It is a named vector. A named vector, its values are black and blue. The names of these values are country and continent. A lot of arguments in ggplot take named vectors. So the idea is that my scales and my lines are actually looking up the color to assign to something based on its name. Technically speaking, they're doing it like this. I create an object called call, call vec, and I say call vec. I subset it to country, it returns black. If I subset it to continent, it returns blue. That is actually what ggplot is doing to retrieve these colors in those scales I showed before. It's a type of thing called a lookup table. We'll do it ourselves in a lookup table in the homework for week eight, I think. So we'll see this in lab. <clears throat> okay. That is an advanced thing. I didn't use anything like that the first like three years I wrote code in R, but I'm showing you in case you need to do it, you can steal this code and modify it. It's okay if you never do it yourself. Okay. So, okay. What we got here is our fussy manual legend plot we just generated. So you might look at a plot like this and immediately become curious about some values in here. So for instance, you might want to maybe know your history. If you're a demographer or somebody, you probably know these things. You might ask yourself, what happened in Africa in the early 1990s and Asia in the 70s here that might result in massive drops in life expectancy? Does anybody know? That's one of them. What's the other one? got the Cambodian genocide and you have the Rwandan genocide. Right? So very few things can precipitously drop life expectancy. Almost nothing does. Uh, genocide is one of them. The other one you see in Africa, of course, what is the other general trend down here in the 90s? Sub-Saharan Africa, HIV. Yeah, so this plot is actually kind of revealing to us some things that happened and you can actually see how badly devastated life expectancy uh, was overall in Africa due to the HIV epidemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. But you can also see there's other things, you know, like genocide really takes big dents um, in these life expectancies. And anyway, that's your uplifting uh, history lesson for today. Um, yeah, so uh, a couple other things I wanna talk about. So, um, Customizing legends, you might want to mess with your legends, make them look in particular ways, do things like flip their orientation, remove them, move them around, combine them or separate them. If you want to do that, my recommendation is the cookbook for our website. This is a good general resource for looking up how to do just about anything in R. It kind of gives you worked examples that you can modify for your own purposes. A lot of other good resources out there, but the cookbook for R is pretty good for um, messing with legends. Okay, another thing you might want to do. Um, so 
if you make a ggplot in an R markdown file and you don't have your R markdown set to self-contained, any plots you make are automatically saved in a figure folder in the same folder as the RMD, typically in .png format, portable network graphics, okay? Pings are a nice lossless image format, good for general images, okay? Um, if you want to save another copy of an image, maybe one that you need to turn into a journal because journals like to uh, have you hand in your images as individual files, which even though you've given to them in a beautiful format like a TIFF or something, they will destroy and publish in a horrible grainy version in the actual copy of the journal article. But if you do want to save and give them them in the hopes that maybe they won't butcher all of the beautiful things you've created, you can use ggsave to generate these images. You can say, GG save, the name of the file you want to create on your computer, the plot equals the plot object you've made. So you just make a GG plot and assign it to an object. And then you would specify the height and width and the units of those. You can actually leave these to default if you just want it to show up however default, but you can set the size of it and it will spit out a image of whatever type you say in the file suffix up here. If I say I saved a file.pdf, it's going to make a PDF image. If I say uh, .jpg, it's going to make a JPEG. .ping is a ping. Okay. You can indeed set the DPI. There's actually the option comma DPI equals, and it will set the uh, number of pixels per inch. There's a lot of other options you can do. And if you're going to save nice plots in R, I actually say if you're going to save um, ping images, I would actually use the RAG subsystem. You can Google R A G G G G plot. And um, the RAG subsystem makes better ping files than the base R one. I normally save things as SVGs, which are um, vector graphics, because um, SVGs are nice and you can zoom in on them infinitely and things like that. And you can also modify them manually because they're really just text files. Anyway, um, yeah. So you can save them this way. Another thing you can do, if you just want to like send your advisor like an image or something or a collaborator, you can actually just display the image in that bottom right viewer, pull it out in R and cut and like screenshot it, that's fine. It's not reproducible. It's not a good way to do it if you're going to like, you're in a real project or an article, but it's a good way to do a quick one that's faster than doing a GG save because sometimes dialing in the actual height and width of your images can take some effort. Okay, so you can save. So I wanted to show you just to some kind of examples. Um, ggplot is perfectly well suited to making publication and complex like plots, so publication ready plots. This is the complete ggplot syntax here uh, for one of the plots in a fairly recent journal article of mine. It's not a pretty plot, but it's an informative plot. So this shows you that totally unmodified, I don't have to do any massaging after the fact, I can dump straight into a document um, publishable, ready to go, a nice plot. This plot right here can be seen in that article. If you go open up that article, this is a plot showing the uh, predicted probability of arrest for individuals um, contacted by police, given the race of the person who reported them to the police, the race of the person being targeted by the police, the type of neighborhood they're in, and the type of crime the police logged at the incident of. Because the police were foolish enough to give me data um, turns out they record the race of people who call the police. You probably didn't know that, but they do that. Anyway, so um, I had those data and I was interested in seeing uh, the cross-racial dynamics. So do the police are the police more likely to arrest people if a white person is calling the police? Imagine what? Yeah, they totally do. So big surprise there. Um, so anyway, so I did a plot like this, but this is a basic GG plot. This is actually like theme black and white. I think, or theme minimal here. I haven't messed with anything. These are just normal dot plots with some bar error bars behind them. It's faceted. This is a facet grid where I have the crime type on one side, the neighborhood type up here. This is just grouped on, um, so this is actually the grouped on the uh, race of reporter and the race of the target. This is a multi-way interaction plot. You can make proper ones. If you want to know how I generated like the data for this, I actually have documentation how, for how to do advanced counterfactuals uh, in an easier way than Chris Adolf teaches in MLE, if you're interested. Um, anyway, so I'm going to plot like that. You could also gussy things up a bit. So I had to give a job talk recently, and I wanted to make really pretty plots for it because you only get one shot in a job talk, so why not dump a lot of effort into it? 
This is an example of a similar coefficient style plot from a job talk I gave for a job I got um, very recently. So this is estimated rate ratios, so counts of crime increasing under different conditions for a whole bunch of different crime types, a whole bunch of different block and neighborhood conditions. Um, I have some text embedded. I have multiple models being shown here because I've got mediation and direct models. And it just kind of looks nice and I even change the fonts. So you can do a lot of stuff in ggplot. This wasn't massaged in any way. I didn't post process this. This is just an R file that generates this. You can really modify things in ggplot if you want and have them totally reproducible. Okay. So <clears throat> anyway. My plug here, um, if you want to get good general visualization, especially with R and ggplot, I highly recommend Kieran Healy's book, Data Visualization, A Practical Introduction. It's targeted at social scientists who don't have technical backgrounds. It's very user friendly. It teaches you some tidyverse R and ggplot at the same time. It teaches good general visualization principles. It uses the exact stuff we use in this class. It uses R with ggplot and the tidyverse. You can get it in print and it's not that expensive or the entire textbook is free online with no content limited in any way. You can go into these slides, click the link or click the link I have on the course website and you got the entire thing there. It's a really good book on visualization. You can basically just browse to it right here at the top click menu and go straight into the textbook. It has embedded R code. I didn't pick the best chapter. It has the plots right in showing you the results. Everything is right there. It's all in here. Okay. This is a fantastic book. And this book is an R Markdown document. It's just written in R Markdown. It generates it as a whole book. All the code is embedded in it. You can download the source code to make this book. Okay. So that's a plug. I have a copy of it up here on the shelf. It's a great book. Okay. So <clears throat> this week's homework. This week's homework, just pick a relationship or a couple relationships to look at in those Gapminder data and write up a little RMD that investigates it or them. You might do something like work with just a subset of data, like just Africa or Asia, or work across all of them. I want you to upload, again, the RMD file and the HTML. Make four to eight plots. Um, don't need to do a ton. Uh, just make it so all your titles, axes, and legends are labeled clearly. Don't use raw variable names unless they're already clean to begin with. Use at least one facet wrap or facet grid. I just really want you to know how to do facet wrap and facet grid because it's really powerful and useful. Um, do at least one manually specified legend. That is one scale something manual, just one of them. Um, you can use any geometries you want. You could use, if you want, just the stuff you've seen today, or you can go explore and use other stuff. There's a ton of geometries out there. Do whatever you want. There's like geom box plot, geom histogram, all that kind of stuff, geom bar and column. Do whatever you want. Okay. Um, all I ask, make it pleasant for a peer to look at, have some organization, hide your code and just show your text and your plots. So use things like echo equals false. Um, and then write up just a little bit of observation. I'm not expecting like statistical, like lingo or anything, but just be like, this plot shows this thing. That's about it. Um, and that's it for your homework. Uh, and of course, on Monday's lab, we will sort of walk through this and do all sorts of examples. Anything you want to know how to do with it, we'll build out the plots to do it. <clears throat> okay, that's all I got for you today. Um, yeah, you got any questions? I'm right here. Otherwise, get out of here. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Nothing.